It's my absolute pleasure to welcome you all today to our Captains of Industry talk and to introduce our sparkling, very special speaker this afternoon, Katie Murray. Now, the purpose of this series of talks is to hear from industry leaders who are really experts in their fields, people who can truly inspire our graduates and students. And I know today's speaker, Katie Murray, will do just that. This is an opportunity for you to hear firsthand about Katie's career journey, the lessons she's learned, and her thoughts on the future of her industry. And that will be a truly valuable insight as you begin to think about your own career ambitions for the future. Or if you're an oldie like me, reflect on where you have been and where you are now. Katie graduated from the Glasgow College of Technology with a degree in accounting and has since had an extremely successful career, quite stellar. With nearly 30 years experience in all areas of financial services, Katie often shares how her GCU degree was fundamental to her many achievements and led to her gaining a prestigious traineeship with Alexander Sloan after graduating. Katie was promoted to her current position as Group Chief Financial Officer at the Royal Bank of Scotland in January 2019 and was one of the first women to achieve such a leadership position within the banking industry. Now, that is no mean feat, I can tell you. And she is speaking at the International Monetary Fund just next week. Katie has been locally an inspirational GCU ambassador, taking time out of her busy international schedule to engage with our students and share her experiences. She is one of our most valued alums. So without further ado, I'm delighted to hand over to Katie Murray to deliver this afternoon's talk. I mean, Pavla, that's quite, quite some introduction. So thank you very much indeed. It's quite funny, I actually see some familiar faces on the thing, so I'm actually more nervous than I normally am. So hello, Ian. I can see your mum hanging off in the corner there as well. Hi, Helen. It's lovely to see you there. And then Anne Gilchrist is also on my screen as well. So it's uh, it's lovely to see familiar faces. And actually, I think talking next week at the IMF might be slightly less daunting, because when you have to talk in front of people that you know, um, you know, Helen, for those of you who will not know her, I used to go to her house when I was 11 or 12, and she used to try to teach me how to put my makeup on. Clearly, she didn't actually succeed because it's something I never wear these days any longer, but she did her best. So, look, thank you very much. It's lovely to do um, these sessions for me. It's lovely just to actually um, get to hear your questions as well and, and to kind of understand some of your challenges. So what I'm going to do is talk for about sort of 20 to 30 minutes. Um, those of you that do know me on the call will know that chatting is not, it comes easily to me. So uh, if I'm going on too long, I know that some of the facilitators will give me some hurry up signs as, as well. But just tell you a little bit of my story, what it's like to be the CFO um, at NatWest Group now, um, no longer RBS Group, which is a sad thing for me, but the right thing for the, for the group. And then a little a bit of chatting about um, COVID and what that's, that means. So I'm a daughter of accountants. My mother and father um, ran the family firm in Mogai, along with my uncle, Murray Anderson and Murray. Um, I think they very kindly in many ways actually it was sold almost exactly the day that I qualified which actually meant that the world opened up to me rather than what you can often have as family pressures to continue along on businesses so but it was very much part of of my background and I think in terms of working with with them um, in in that office admittedly though I was given far more menial tasks than anything to do with the with accounting it was really I got a lot of what's kind of taking me through this of of working hard and being very authentic in what I'm doing and how I'm kind of behaving in the office has been a real, a really important part of, of my own life. And then also making sure that you have fun. We spend a lot of time in the office. We do a lot of really difficult things, a lot of very challenging projects. And actually just to make sure that you can really enjoy that challenge and be open about the challenges and make sure that you're having a lot of fun and really enjoying it while you're, while you're doing it, I think is really important. I work really hard on be, being collaborative. I think the very worst thing that you could do to me is say, right, Katie, off you go into that, that office and then in two months time, come out with um, 
with your great thoughts on a particular topic because I can absolutely guarantee I would do nothing for the first sort of month and a half and then go into kind of a blind panic. I absolutely um, thrive on um, on the, um, the working with others and really making sure that we, we collaborate in, in that basis. You know, I've had a, a lot of opportunities. It terrifies me when people say yeah, I've been nearly 30 years in, in, in financing and accounting because in my, my mind, I'm still 22 and I've only just recently graduated from Glasgow Tech. So um, how I can have 30 years behind me is really interesting. But, you know, I left Glasgow Tech and I, I went very purposely and, and did a, a chartered accountancy qualification. And what I would say is I, I did that to a large extent because my parents were chartered accountants. And I would say at that time, I didn't realise that there was a SEMA or there was an ACCA option to me. You know, and if I look around my office today, the people that I rely on, one individual that I rely on the, the most is a, a chap called Stuart Nimmo. He's the head of my financial planning and analysis team. You know, I would speak to him almost daily and he's SEMA qualified. And actually the reason he's SEMA qualified is why he's brilliant at the job that he's doing. So I think often when you're in this last stage, you think, oh, if I don't get chartered, it's going to be a big issue. But I, I don't think it is. I think find the right opportunity for you and really enjoy that. But I went to Alexander Sloan's. It was a great opportunity for me. And um, what was great, it was still in the days when small firms were allowed to audit big companies, you know, and we had some very big clients in that space. And so then ultimately, when I finished there, I actually went away for a year traveling. And uh, people said to me, mainly my friends said, oh, you can't go traveling for a year. What about your career? You know, you've got to kind of crack on and go on with that. But actually people like um, Helen or my mom said, oh, don't be ridiculous, you're 22 years old. Go away, um, decompress a little bit and then come back and then your career will still be there waiting for you. And that was very, very sound advice. So then when I did come back, I had two job offers in play. One was at Ernest & Young in Glasgow and one was at KPMG in London. The reason I got the KPMG job in London was because of the experiences I'd had at Alexander Sloan, where I'd audited our insurance company. It amazed me that I got the job at EY in, in Glasgow because they, um, they, they asked me questions about pension accounting in SAP 24, which none of you will remember, but some of us old dogs in accounting will still remember SAP 24. And I was sitting in the meeting and I said, I have no idea what that answer is. I'm terribly sorry. But I said, this is how I would go about finding the answer. And I think the reality that dropped, taught me one of the big lessons is in being very honest in difficult situations, you don't actually close doors. So never be embarrassed when you don't know the answer. Always tell them you don't know rather than kind of make it up and explain how you might move forward. But actually, my parents said to me, Katie, go to London. This was their second issue of, of sending me out, having once of first of all sold the practice and then secondly saying, actually, like Katie, you're 24 years old. At this point, go off to London, get some different experiences underneath your belt. You know, you can come back to Scotland um, when you want. I wouldn't have imagined, you know, all those years later, I would still be here. But anyway, I went to KPMG, which was a fantastic experience. And I think in that I learned some of my, my greatest opportunities of actually when there's an opportunity comes up, stick your hand up in the air and say, let me do that. Let me do that. Let me do that. And I think when you do that, people know that actually Katie's someone who's always happy to take on different projects. She's happy to put herself in difficult positions. You know, one moment I remember very well is that I, uh, I was doing a project in Spain and um, I had a translator uh, working with me in doing the project. And I was basically telling this insurance company that they were going to be insolvent under a different method of, of analysis. And they all, the Spanish directors, they're all men and they all stood up and they were shouting and yelling at me. And the, um, the translator was still translating. I'm like, it's okay. Their actions kind of, you don't need to translate. I understand what they're saying to me. And it was a really important lesson because actually after the meeting, um, the CFO at the time said, that was a brilliant meeting, Katie. We've got all of their issues out on the table and you should be really proud. I then flew back from Barcelona that night back to London and coincidentally, my husband was meeting me at the airport and I came out of the airplane and burst into tears saying, I've just had one of the worst experiences of my professional career being shouted at all by me, by all these directors who I was trying to deliver a service to. But looking back, actually, it was one of the best lessons. Get your problems out on the table and then we can address the problems. I have to say he has never met me at the airport ever again after that experience. And that was also probably about 30 years ago. But, you know, it was a really important um, lesson. Then working through KPMG, ultimately, I was doing a project with a company called Old Mutual. And I realized when I was working with them, I designed the perfect next step for me. So after 13 very happy years 
with KPMG where I had like traveled the world e extensively with them. They then paid for me to learn to speak Spanish so that I could then understand the directors um, directly when they were incredibly unhappy with me, uh, which they, that relationship did improve over time. I joined Old Mutual and that was, that was great. The transition out of consulting um, and out of kind of practice is a really, it's a really big step. But I came to work for a, a man, um, John Ross, who was, you know, truly inspirational and pivotal in my own career. He just gave me endless opportunity. And he made me do some really difficult things, which when I was sort of 32 years old were really important. He was a small finance function, but we had to really restructure and everybody had to be restructured, which is a code for me firing them from the business was then allocated over to me. I would then redesign their job and then ultimately exit them. But those are really important skills to learn. How do you restructure positions? How do you, how do, you do different things with organizations in very sort of short periods of, of, of time? And how do you exit people very elegantly from the organization so that actually ultimately they exit in many cases as my friends um, and certainly people who've come back to me to work for me in later periods. So a really important time. While I was working there, I got the chance to go to be the CFO of um, the business in South Africa. It was the, the biggest business. It was based out of Johannesburg. And, um, and I kind of went, I'd say with a little bit of arrogance of, you know, I'm the group head of finance. I know what I'm doing and how I'm how I should deliver in this Johannesburg business, you know, because I'd been taking their numbers in for a very long time. And I think I got there and thought, actually, I have no idea how you run this business. How do you go out to retail mass customers and get them to pay their premium every month? And all of those tiny premiums actually add up to really important bits of income. So again, I think it was a really good lesson of actually how do things work? whether it's, you know, how does a business really work from the, the, the ground up and actually that so that it really adds income or it adds costs. It's very easy when you're sitting in the centre to add them all together. When you're out in the field to add a billion pounds of income is a, just an almost impossible task to be asked. And um, I think to really understand that piece was something that was really important. So I worked there for, for five years. It was a, a, a really great time professionally also and personally my husband and I went there as two we came back as three plus two dogs so it was a great a great time as a family as as well and I came back to the director of, of finance at RBS and again that was another really important lesson you know I was the CFO of the biggest um, insurance banking um, business in South Africa which basically meant then in Africa so I kind of you know was one of the the, the, the big fish in the in quite a small pond and then I did a sideways move over into RBS, which was quite kind of hard at the time because I thought, mm, sideways, am I, am, I, am I doing the wrong thing here? But in reality, it was great. And it kind of came back to one of my opening points. The guy I was coming to work for, a chap called Ewan Stevenson, he said, Katie, I know you think you're giving things up because I was no longer responsible for capital or no longer responsible for these other things. But in giving these things up, I promise I will give you lots of difficult things to do and that we will have a lot of fun doing them. And I would sort of say two years down the line, I sort of said, God, you, you really kept that promise, didn't you, um, Ewan? So don't be afraid sometimes of, this, of the sideways movements because they open up other doors. And I think by taking that sideways movement, that's why I've got the job I have today, because actually I added banking properly onto my CV and I got very well known in an organisation. Um, before the next the next role came up and then he made me um, two years later he made me deputy CFO which was was really great and it's a real kind of sign of sponsorship from above because he knew that by making me deputy CFO he knew that in two years time he would be moving on one way or the other and so therefore it put me in a very good position as being the internal candidate to kind of take over from him and then in sort of uh, October I think I was I became interim CFO and then ultimately confirmed for the 1st of January 2019 and um, and I think that was I mean I could tell you all about that recruitment process but it was one of the one of I think the toughest I'd ever been through in my life and for many of you you're coming up to your final exams or you're doing PhD thesis or, or different things like that and I would say that I approached that CFO recruitment position in a very very diligent manner you know I went through and I worked out exactly what I knew and what I didn't know, where they would criticize me for gaps in my, in my arsenal, how I would answer those criticisms. 
and just sort of talk about how I would deal with not knowing, which kind of goes back a little bit to my EY conversation of right at the beginning, be honest about, I know you're worried, I'm not good enough in this space, but this is how I will, I will really um, address that, that gap. So I think that was really important. And then um, I also got my hair blow dried three times a week for four months, which I said to my boss at the time, I said, if I do not get this job, I am sending you the bill for this hair, these hair appointments. Because they kept saying, well, you don't look the part. And I'm like, yeah, there are no banking CFOs in Europe that are female. Of course, I don't look the part. You know, <laughs> there is no part for me to look like. And, um, and Helen, even from time to time, lipstick went across my, my face um, from that sort of time. But it was one of the important lessons of there are moments that you need to make sure that you really fit in. And so when it's board day or big announcement day or something today when I have the role, people expect you to be a certain person. And it gives them great comfort when you walk in and they realize in the first few seconds that you are that person. You know, and then very quickly they get greater comfort because they also realize that I'm authentic and I'm 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 someone that they can approach as well and have the conversation. So I think that's that was a real kind of balancing point for me as well. But then I guess I became the, the CFO and it's been two years. I, I think often as a CFO, you think of it in lines of quarterly announcements. I'm about to do my ninth um, set of results. And that's probably one of the hardest bits of the role. But what's interesting, I was saying to the team earlier and to you that I'm speaking at the IMF next week. And then um, I think what's, what's interesting there, they asked me to speak two years ago and I'm like, I'm absolutely not ready. There's no way I, I've got to do results. I've got to get them out. Last year, they said, no, no, come and speak this year. I'm like, no, 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 I'm still not ready. I've got results two weeks after the IMF. And it was very interesting for me. The third time they said, will you please come in and do some work at the IMF? I then said, okay, I can come now, I'm ready. And then of course it gets canceled for COVID. So I'll be doing it from upstairs in my, in my attic, uh, which means I get to miss the opportunity of Washington. But I think in there, it's important when you take on these big roles is to do things relatively slowly so that you're able to deliver the core of your role, which for me is the quarterly announcement piece, and then add in other things as you, as you move forward. You know, one of the questions I've been asked is how do you balance a demanding workload and now also working from home? In some ways, working from home has really helped um, because, you know, I have a, a small daughter. I heard her at the door a moment ago, but she's about this high. She's eight, she's nine years old. And it means that actually I've seen her a little bit more. In other ways, it doesn't help because um, actually it's helpful to have all of the people around about you that you can really resolve issues um, very, very quickly but it has taken out my commute. I'm lucky my commute is actually very short. It's only about 15 minutes into the center of London. I, I am the CFO and so I get driven to the office as well. So therefore it's a very kind of short sort of time. But there are, that's kind of helped. I think the way the demanding workload that you do, that are the way I've done it is ruthless compartmentalization. So to say I'm in work now, you know and make sure you do and find a job that you really love and enjoy so that it's not work and um, per se but then actually when I'm not in work then I'm not in work and I do small things like I run two telephones so I have my work telephone and my personal telephone my work telephone is never far away but on the weekend it's at the bottom of my handbag rather than at the top of my handbag and then I have I have the other one there so it's just about how do you actually kind of balance them and I think I talk a lot about um it's the integration of life rather than the nine to five is work and the evening is is Isla and my husband Stephen. It's really about actually the reality is that they all integrate together and you have to work out how you get the right balance. You know, um, I think one of the other aspects of, of my role is, you know, the being the executive director of, of a on a board and also of a bank, it's a really um, important piece. And I think how you get the right balance in that is is people often say to me, well, how does it work? Why does it work? And I think it really works when um, actually when you invest in the relationships. So when you spend the time working out, I've got big debates I've got to get through. I've got difficult decisions I've got to get through. And actually, who are the people on the board or the executive committee that I need to know if they're happy or unhappy before I walk into that room? Because if I only find out they're unhappy in that room, I can guarantee I'm dead before I've kind of walked into the room. And so therefore, I spend a lot of time going, I've got, I've got this decision and um, there's a whole dividend debate going on with banks, which you may or may not be familiar with at the moment. But general times dividends are often big debates. 
So I will go and talk to the head of risk. I'll talk to the head of the audit committee. I'll make sure that the senior independent director is happy. So you kind of know you've got four or five votes in your bag and they're the four or five votes that you need so that you don't get a surprise in the room. So I think really investing time in those relationships, really understanding people's views in terms of what, what your debate might be on or, or how they might um, not agree with you is, is, really, is really important. And I think also when you don't win everything in the, the boardroom or the executive room, not to also get over anxious about that because actually there's often really good reasons why decisions need to be taken away and worked on a, a little bit more. So I think that's that's been a very important part of it. I was going to talk about COVID as well. So COVID has been um, COVID has been a really you know huge I mean huge thing that in itself underestimates it. You know, but we got a new CEO um, on the first of November last year. And um, and then we were we did our results. We announced our new strategy. The share price went down ten percent. That was quite hard, um, for lots of different um, reasons. And then about a month later, this flu that we'd all been hearing about all of a sudden became a real reality, um, for for us. You know, the if you're a, a a bank and you're the CFO of a bank, the quickest thing that happens to you is you start to see money leaving, and all of a sudden we could see at the tail end of March that people were pulling down on their rolling credit facilities. So basically it's the people who've got the big, big companies who've got the equivalent of bank overdrafts sitting, waiting for us, for them to be used. And all of a sudden the money was starting to move. And then you sit there and you think, well, that's okay. The global financial crisis, I think their capital level was about six or 7%. It may even be lower than that. You know, we're sitting here at 16%, we'll be all right. But then it kind of starts to move again. And then I would say, thankfully, the government actually moved really, really quickly. And it's very easy to be very um, critical of the government. And I think we all have debates of, of different announcements they've done. But what they did was they moved very quickly so that what was a health and economic crisis didn't become a banking crisis. And actually, they put the right methods in place um, at, at real speed working in tandem with a lot of the banks, which has meant that as a bank, what I would have spent most of April doing was worrying about our liquidity and our capital position. Actually, what we could really do was worry about how do we help our staff and how do we help our customers? So within two weeks, I mean, and Pamela, you'd have done this at the university as well. Everybody went online, everybody worked from home. You know, we've got 50,000 people who work from home more or less full time, you know, and that includes all of our, our customer, our care staff. It includes our traders, and um, though some of them have started to come back into the office. It in includes all of the finance department. And then we had about 10,000 people who were still working in branches, making sure that we could, we could meet and work with um, our retail customers. And I'm sure some of you have had to go to the branch over the last number of months and you've been highly frustrated by the lines because they have been longer than, than we would like them to be. But for those branch staff of ours who kind of every day continued to work and continue to go into the branch to make sure that we could meet with our retail customers. I mean, it was an absolute um, lifeline, I think, for many of them. And, you know, we, we did um, a lot of really great things. You know, if you were a small business, we set up government lending schemes, you know, literally within days. Normally, a new product in a bank takes about a year to get approved and get operational. And we had people that managed to spin up products literally within, you know, in less than a week. We've put out about 10 billion pounds of lending into the economy under, under those schemes. We did payment holidays for people on, um, on mortgages. We did payment holidays for people on, um, on credit cards as, as well. And we did some really lovely personal things. We opened Gogoburn, which is our Edinburgh facility as a food bank. The kitchens in Gogoburn were being used by Baxter Story, who normally supply the catering to the office to supply catering to the, to the hospitals. We did an, a large number of, of customer care calls to the over 70s to make sure that they were um, that they knew how they could get funding if they needed it. Um, and sometimes those calls were quite heartbreaking because the people would say, I haven't spoken to anyone all week and actually I don't have any food. And our branch staff constantly amazed me. And so they sort out food packages and, and get the, the right things out to some of our customers. You know, I had a few of my father's friends or friends of, or parents of, of friends of mine who would say, you know, I got a call from the bank. I didn't need anything, but it was lovely to think that you were there. And if you think of the last financial crisis, you know, the banks naturally and rightly got a huge amount of criticism. 
So it was a really important time, I think, this time around that we could actually say, no, we're at the front line and we're doing the right things for our, our customers. You know, and there will be there will be hard times ahead as we kind of work through how a lot of that lending unwinds and we'll we'll seek to do that as, as well as we as well as that we, we can. I think just if I talk a little bit about the um, the working from home, you know, in this we this in, the, in September, we brought in 245 new graduates into the bank. None of them have come into the office. They've done all of it um, from their their parents upstairs room or their what were their university lodgings. And there's a huge kind of desire from some people to get back into the bank, but from other people to say, actually, this has really worked well for me, kind of working from home. In Bishopsgate, where I would normally do these kind of calls from, we've got desk capacity for 3,400 people. There are 160 people working in that office this week, you know, and, and they're mainly traders or a small number of people that have said, look, actually, I, I need to just come into the office because working from home is, is, is driving me nuts. And actually, I just need a little bit of space between myself and my, my home life. In Gogoburn, I got the stats this morning because I thought you'd be interested in them. So there are 4,000 desks in Gogoburn. Those 4,000 desks would normally support about 6,000 people because not everybody would work all day or all the time. And there are 157 people in the off in that office this week. So Gogoburn, most some of you will have been there um, for one reason or another, but it has a Tesco's, it has a hairdresser's, it has a beauty salon, it has a news agent and a bookshop in it, in the actual office building. And there's 157 people working there this week. So it has been absolutely um, in dramatic. And I think for our graduates who are starting in that world, um, in terms of being at home, is how we've managed to make that work has been really, really kind of, um, I think, impressive. So as you start to go towards um, that sort of job market, I would say, don't let COVID put you off. I actually think it's opened up some opportunities where you can apply for jobs that are not in the right location for you. You might think that you're more restricted to the west of Scotland or the, the, the central belt kind of corridor. But actually, I know that we look and now take on people who are located in different parts of the UK because they've got the, the right skills. I would say from my own sort of career, you know, take some risks, put your hand up and just sort of say, I'll, I'll, I'll can do that. I can do that. I can do that. And, you know, when you, you get the chance to do it and you realise that you, that you can't do it or you need some extra help, you know, there's people around who will always be willing to, to, help, to help you. My husband's actually, Stephen's also a Glasgow um, Caledonian alumni. So I not only got a degree, but I got a husband. He's working um, just in the bedroom across the landing from us. He, um, in the last couple of weeks, actually became the interim CEO for UNICEF UK. So a completely different kind of job, same degree, gone in a different way. And I think he, for me, has been one of the real learnings of, I've all of a sudden become this, this CEO and actually, how do I make sure I take that risk and ask people to help me. And it's amazing the people that will come out. So I can just, our own lessons um, from that time, I, I cannot in, in emphasize that enough. You will make mistakes. Some of them will be very upsetting. I've cried more than just at the airport and that that's okay. Um, you know, and I think just admit when you've made a mistake and you've got it wrong and then work out how you can learn from it. You know, have a bit of a longer term plan. You know, that longer term plan will evolve, but accept that it's made up of, a number of short term plans that will mean that your end longer term position will be slightly different from what you imagined, but have a little bit of a view, you know, I think would be there and, you know, just be open to the opportunities when they when they come, you might not have to learn to speak another language. But um, that was that was fun as well, but they things will take you in lots of different different ways and but look after your networks, some of the colleagues and people that you've met at university you'll know for the rest of your life and they'll be valuable other people you will pick up along your way. And uh, I think I'd really encourage you. Some of my best mentors are people that mentored me when I was working, you know, in Switzerland, when I was with K KPMG, when I was sort of in my late twenties and, and early thirties, and they were huge mentors and they, they remain really great mentors today, you know, and, and then, you know, so I would really advise you to really take credit and, you know, really look after those relationships. And if you're wanting to go on a graduate, graduate training scheme next year, pull your finger out, get the work done now because those schemes are getting filled up today. Don't think they'll still be around. So if you haven't got onto them or you want to get into them, you want to look at what you want to do, please do pay that attention. You know, you and Stevenson who 
was the CFO at RBS when I joined and he's now the CFO of HSBC um, globally. He said an important thing to me as part of the recruitment process of, Katie, focus on the things today that will get you this job. The other things that you want to do as well, they can come later, but focus on the things. So I think when you're, for those of you who are looking to graduate and move on to the next step, do focus on, on getting your degree finished, but also the things that help you get the, the, get the, next, get the next job. And I would say, you know, keep positive. It will be demoralizing. I can remember, you know, when I was going through my own recruitment, leaving from, from Glasgow, Glasgow Tech, I was trying to get into this firm or that firm. And, you know, whether it was the, the, the big name firms, I went to Alexander Stone and actually that worked out to be the perfect place for me. And I, th I think, um, you know, don't worry when it doesn't work exactly the way that you, you might imagine it, would, it can do because different, different paths will reach you, take you on different journeys. And I think um, Pamela, I was maybe going to stop there and move on to Q and A if that works. I'm just yeah, watching my clock in the corner a little bit faster, but I, no, I know you're all Scottish, so you can listen quickly. So uh, yeah, that's was, absolutely that great, Katie. Thanks so much for that. I'm sure everybody really enjoyed that. Um, and and just to say to to everyone, um, Katie shared with us in in the kind of pre meeting that we had that having this engagement with the likes of yourselves as, as students um, and and graduates um, really energizes her so we you know use this opportunity to to take advantage of, of having Katie here to ask the questions that you want to ask as I said at the beginning if anybody missed that you can use the raise hand facility that they have next to the, the three dots next to your name um, but you can also submit questions in, in the chat facility but I am going to start with one of the questions that was kind of pre-submitted and this question comes from Raheem Khan who is um, subject areas international banking finance and risk management just for your information Katie um, and the question is what are the biggest factors that helped you be successful after graduating? So I mean look it's a, a great question I would say um, there was a lot of um, belief in me um, from from my my family and, and things like that as well so that the support network is is really important but i think it really was um it was putting my hands up just to try new things and to really kind of in, enjoy it and to put myself often in positions that that made you a little bit uncomfortable um i think to kind of really tr try that out and like i i worked hard as graduating i worked an awful lot harder after graduating as well you know I, my my mom is um, sadly no longer with us but she used to say to me i don't know why you've done so well katie you were never at that bright when you were at school so i, I don't quite don't quite understand why you've got the job you've got today and it really was because i mean i worked i really really worked and i made sure that um, i found people that could really help me so i think once you graduate you know graduation is important it's important you get the best degree that you can get but for me afterwards the taking advantage of all of those opportunities that will come and really making sure that you get the right network and that you you do work you don't only work i think my comments earlier about compartmentalizing is really important so make sure you also enjoy in, enjoy life and make sure you have those adventures but actually put yourself out there and just really take the opportunities that they come and accept there will be some long late nights um, I had a lovely moment when I got a new car and my husband drove it past the office so that I could see the colour of it. And um, it was a terrible colour. I don't know why I picked it. He never forgave me for years. But um, and that's the more extreme moment. But there are moments when you actually in doing doing some of those things, they they pay real benefit as you go through. I mean, in fact, just thinking about it there, that job that was making me work really hard. I was when I was at KPMG and I was working for a very senior banking partner. Um, called Brendan Nelson. When I was interviewing for the RBS job, he was the audit committee chair and he looked at the list of people and he said, Katie Murray, I know her, she will be able to do this job. And that was because of a project I delivered for him 20 years earlier. So it's one of the things, once you get known, you deliver, you don't know what's going to help you 20 years down the line. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I don't see any hands up or, or any questions in the chat, so I will move, move on to one of the other pre-submitted questions. And this one comes from Kirsty Hughes, who's studying business studies. Uh, oh, sorry, graduated from business studies. Have you ever experienced imposter syndrome or feelings of doubt during your career? If so, how did you overcome this? Yeah, look, I mean, often and still today, um, I, I have these, I have those moments. Um, and I think it's a it's a real 
it's a real reality. I have a, a, a great friend, uh, Martina Neary, who's a partner at, at EY. And we sometimes joke together and sort of talk about, you know, how did we end up in these jobs and what was it that we that we that we did? Because really we're just kind of Katie and Martina. And I think actually being, I would sort of say, be honest where you don't know something. Don't be lacking in confidence in not knowing those things. And I think that's really important because um, when you get people who also don't know things and are very nervous and anxious about it, then you you want to know that they have that kind of innate confidence. So I know that to have got the job I've got today and to have had the different jobs, they didn't come by accident. You know, they were a result of things that I had delivered. They were they came at the right time for me as well in the, as in the career. I couldn't have left, you know, uh, Glasgow Caledonia and become the CFO of the bank. That wouldn't be a step anyone would ever make. I had to go on the journey and make some mistakes and do some learning as I as I went along the way. And I think it's to kind of to remember the things that you've delivered as you've gone back and why were some things successful. You know, the imposter syndrome is not altogether unhelpful either. I think Martina and I talk about we get delivered a little bit by fear. That fear makes you work a little bit harder and make sure that you're a little bit more prepared than you might need to be. You know, I've, one of my first board meetings when I was a CFO, this one board member who I find quite tough because he's a, he's a corporate finance guy, an investment banker, very different kind of background to my own. And he came up to me after and he said, Katie, I can tell you spent a lot of time preparing for your presentation today. And he said, I just want to let you know that your preparation didn't go to waste and you came across really well. So it is around when you have those imposter moments, do that extra level of preparation um, to make sure that, that Robert Gillespie is happy with you at the end, because those are hard kind of taskmasters. And then find your mentors and your mentees and just say, I am worried about this, you know, and sometimes they will say, why oh, are you wasting your time worrying about that? You know, and that kind of can be quite, can be quite kind of helpful. But, um, you know, it is there, it's there today, you know, and, um, you know, I, I sit on lots of forums and people talk in acronyms and you think, God, is that really what they're talking about? Should I be worrying about that? Should I not be worrying about this? You know, and you take take the time to reflect and when really worry, is it is it something that's going to be a problem in a week or is it only something that's going to be a problem in the next hour? And if it's only going to be a problem in the next hour, it's probably not that big of a problem. But uh, it's real, it's real today. I think today I just know how to manage it better than I did probably when I was in my early 20s. Okay, thank you for that. Um, now, I think there's just some questions coming in in the- Oh, the I can see them, yes. Now. So I, I, I will turn to them in a second, um, but just asking maybe one of the more pre-submitted questions and then I can I can have a wee look at the chat facility. So this one comes from Elizabeth Steele, who's a student from finance, banking and risk management. Um, and it is specifically around kind of the sector. Alongside the traditional competencies, technical and executive, what other skill skills should we be developing to stay abreast and be prepared for leadership roles within banking and finance? So, I mean, look, the technical skills, you're all bright, you can learn them sort of thing. I actually think the most important skills are your people skills. And how do you develop things like empathy um, in terms of when you work with people? How do you understand and relate to your, to your staff? Those are the most fundamental skills I think you can develop. How do you develop team building? How do you get your staff when you know you're doing a really difficult project that requires everybody to go that little bit further to follow you and to make sure that they want to do what you you want to do i mean i did in my my past life i was very involved in the in the girl guides and i honestly believe it gave me such a level of base confidence in terms of the opportunities i had when i was a teenager and a young a very young adult so find those experiences that will give you those sort of experience whether that's your Saturday job or the, the job you might have done, you know, when you were working at Tesco's, they will all be giving you really good experiences. Get involved and have to work with people so that you can understand what it's like to work with people. You know, Ewan, who I have a huge amount of time for, he said, you know, his, his job when he was at university is I worked at McDonald's. He's now the CFO of HSBC, probably the biggest banking job in the world, you know, in, in terms of in the finance kind of space. And he said, but I learned how to work with people. Um, because I did a job in McDonald's and I had to deal with all sorts of different people. So you're at a stage, many of you will have part-time jobs. You are learning skills in there that you don't even realize that you're learning. And I think that those, for me, the people who have empathy and the ability to relate and can be just good, authentic leaders, actually, those are the people that get to the, the, top, of the, the top of the heap 
you know, learn your technical stuff, but you'll all know your technical stuff and those people around about you will as well. And I think those are some of the really important skills. Okay, thanks for that. We will switch to um, a question on the, the chat facility that comes from Daniel Robertson. With the rise of online challenger banks as Monzo and Starlin, is there still a future for the high street retail banking? Yeah, no, it, it's, um, I think Monzo and Starling Bank have been brilliant for banks like um, Royal Bank Scotland and Lloyds and all of us, because actually they held a mirror up and they said, guys, you're really not that great with your customers. You're kind of taking them for granted and you're relying on huge kind of um, customer, um, you know, just, I can't remember the right word, my mind has now just gone blank there, but kind of customer atrophy, not to leave. So I'm just going to stay with you because it's easier to stay than it is to move. And so actually as a result, what's happened is we've, our, you know, app that our on our phone, many of you will use the RBS app, is as good and if not better as, as many of those, of those kind of apps. But I do think there is a future for high street retail banking, but it will be different um, than it's been done in, in the past, you know. I get to go to visit um, branches. Um, I was up in Glasgow actually a month or so. I went to spend the morning um, at the um, the branch in Mulgai, um, just to sort of see what's who's coming into the branch. What are they doing? And there are moments in your financial career that you will need advice. You know whether it's around getting your first mortgage or your first business loan, and that's when I think you'll go into the high street uh, branch. What's been really interesting as part of COVID is that before COVID we were just starting to do um, a lot of um, mortgages and things via video, via um, coaching of people on their small business loans via video. That's now gone up to about 14% of our interactions are all done on that basis. That's been a huge change in a very short period of time because people still want um, some kind of customer inter interaction. You know, so I think that the, the high street will still be there, but what you won't have, as we often had in the high street, if you went to if you went to South Kensington here in London, you'd see on one side of the road there was Royal Bank of Scotland and the other side of the road there was NatWest, both owned by the same company. You don't need two of them and you don't need another one, you know, another mile down the road. So there will be, there are less of them, but I think banks still play a very important part on the high street. And we know in terms of the narrative that when we, um, when we have closed branches, which we have done obviously in the past, that the emotional journey of closing a local branch where there is not a local branch or another facility nearby is really, really important. And that's why, you know, we can see in our data, yep, the likes of Monzo is important, that they're not being as used as much now during COVID as they were before, because people often use them as, as separate accounts, but I think they've been fantastic. So I do, I do believe that there is still a future for us because people in the moments that matter need to be able to speak to somebody and to come in. And then when I was working in the Mogai branch, it's also, banking branches and I'd never really realized this they also they pay a very important social role you know and often for the older parts of society who will come into the branch you know I was thinking why are all these old people coming into this branch they're all meant to be at home not getting COVID like what on earth are you doing but actually many of them are lonely and they need they are going out to get some kind of human human interaction as well and to manage their finances or the web is just too frightening or they don't want they don't really trust mobile at the beginning of COVID, what was really interesting is a lot of them were coming in to be taught how to use online banking and how to actually make that transition to mobile. So we've seen huge uptake in that space. But nonetheless, I, I still think that there's, there, there's an important role for it to be playing, playing going forward. OK, wonderful. And um, sticking with the, the chat facility, but ch slightly changing um, the topic, um, you and Birch um, obviously thanks you for, for what you've the advice that you've given today, first and foremost, but touches on the theme of cyber um, risk. Um, Ewan works in the, the cyber security, but a lot of similarities in finance sector with risk compliance and regulation. What cyber risk do you see in your organisation that may impact on you financially and how do you deal with balancing that? Yeah, so I mean, look, cyber is really, I mean, it's really, really important for, for all of us. And it's something not just in the cyber space, but also in the wider um, technology um, space and particularly technology involves that actually to operate at a senior level in any organization, you really under, need to understand what's happening um, in terms of the new technologies that are coming in and what risks and opportunities they're opening up to us. Now, as a bank, you can imagine we have a lot of DDoS attacks to us kind of every single day. The cyber team 
you know, the, the one team, when they come and ask for more funding, they generally get it because it's just, it's really important in terms of how we, 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 um, how we continue to fund them appropriately. It's one of the areas where there's huge um, collaboration between the banks and also really importantly between our, our customers. You know, many of you will remember the, the British Airways attack that happened, um, I think it was last year, where there was a huge amount of customer data that kind of went out. One of the first places they called was our banking cyber team to kind of help saying, how do we deal with this? Because actually banks, because we it's so important what we do, we are really, I think, in many ways, quite a hot ahead of that. One of the interesting things that NatWest did is that they sent um, many of their senior executives, a huge amount of us, to go on this course at a place called Singularity University. Now, it's not it's not really a university in the way that you, you are obviously a university. It was more of a kind of further education place. Interestingly, it was based on the NASA campsite um, in San Francisco, and it would be people from all different industries for a very very intensive kind of week of training to learn very much about the new technology to learn about what was happening and on in cyber what it was a multidisciplinary course so i was on the course with um a number of people interestingly who were there from the army as well and from the very most senior sort of levels of military so that we could kind of swap understanding of how a lot of these technologies were being used not just in the banks but also elsewhere i mean probably one of the most kind of interesting courses that i've ever been on to make sure that we as senior executives understood what was really happening in that cyberspace. So I think it's it's really important. I imagine you get some training on it and I would really encourage that you do spend time understanding it because it is, I think, one of the biggest the biggest threats um, that, that any of us face, um, you know, whether it be at national level or with, within um, within different different companies in terms of if there was a significant break in, how would we deal with it? It's something we spend a lot of time debating. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Sarah Wilson has um, a question that, that's about your career and, and would apply to all of our graduates, um, regardless of the, the kind of sector that they work in. Um, again, thanks to you for an inspiring talk, but Sage, you've had a varied career working in several, several different firms. How do you know when is the right time to move to a new firm or seek a new opportunity? So it's, it's one of those things that you don't, often the opportunity seeks you out a little bit. Um, but what I would say is I look as I look back over my career, I would say I get most of my best learning in the first three years of a role. In the fourth year, I'm pretty effective and I'm putting a putting almost paying back for all of the learning that I've done. I'm quite a fan of the three to five year uh, piece because I think you've also got to live with the misery of some of your decisions. And if you move every two years, you don't realize that a system that you put in maybe wasn't as effective as um, as as you believed it was so I think you kind of learn but I mean my jobs have generally lasted in that three to five year kind of timeline and they probably extended as I've I've got more senior more to the five year rather than the three year I, I would say within within that time so I think that that's when you're starting to look out the window a bit more during the day or when you're not quite so willing to work on a Saturday morning to kind of do that extra piece of work you do for your role, it's probably time for you to start thinking of what's the next the next position. But I, I mean, I really do kind of encourage new graduates as you would be is try to do a role for two years. And then probably as you get further up your career, it will kind of extend more to the five year, the five year level. But I mean, I do sort of think, you know, when I was originally going to South Africa, they suggested to me from the home office firm in London, I go for two years. And I'm like, I said, after two years, I'll have basically just worked out what I'm doing. Because that's not time to bring me back, actually. You want me to then deliver for the next three years, having learned what I was actually doing. And that really was true. So I think they kind of the timeline dictates a little bit of the size of the role. But I would certainly think in that three, three to five, three to five year time is time to face a new opportunity. OK, wonderful. I am going to switch um, uh, back to some of the pre-submitted um, questions just to allow those people who, who did submit uh, questions. And it's quite a short question and it comes from Beth Donaldson, who's a graduate of our accountancy course. And uh, Beth just asked, what is the most challenging aspect of your role? So the bit that keeps me awake at night and that I torture myself with is um, kind of market guidance. So. Um, you know, I, I stand up once a quarter to talk to the market to do results and it's 
I have a lovely friend actually this evening coming around for dinner who's a, a member of the board of the IESB and she has an amazing knack of emailing me on the day I'm doing results and she sort of says I don't understand why they put you through this ritual once a quarter torture and you know you stand up you do your 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 presentation and that's fine you know I'm very comfortable presenting I'm very comfortable doing the Q&A and in it I'll try to give market guidance so I'll say things like my risk weighted assets are going to be between 185 to 195 by the end of the year you know and then that will be more or less right more or less wrong or the in banking we talk a huge amount about net interest margin I hate giving net interest margin advice because I'm basically doing one bit one basis points advice so one one hundredth of a percentile I'm trying to guide people to and it's very easy to be out by three basis points you know so that's three hundredths of a percentile that I'm out by and I absolutely torture myself over over those bits of guidance I torture on the day that I do it and then for the weeks afterwards, oh, I should have said it this way. I should have said it that way. And that's really the hard bit. And that's where Alison, our, my CEO, comes in. And she goes, like, Katie, I know you're torturing yourself about this. But um, I think those are they're really important meetings that we do. And the things that I say um, dictate what happens to the stock price on that day. And that means I'll be meeting investors the next week because of the comments that I made. They will have lost or gained tens of millions of pounds and then our chairman, Sir Howard Davis, he likes to make it even more of a game. So when we're talking, he does this really naughty thing. He has his phone open on the lectern. And then at the end of it, he goes, right, Katie, when Alison was talking, the share price went up by 2%. And when you were talking, it came down by 1% initially, but then went back up again and, and things like that. And that that's really hard. So I think the, the hardest bit is the market advice because it is so important. Um, and it's you're trying to guide on things, particularly at the moment, that are so very, very hard. But those are those are the bits. If ever I'm awake at night, it's because I answered a question too quickly or with not quite enough precision in the exact words that I used. I also know at that point I'm torturing myself about the point of a needle, you know, and actually, you know, it's it's kind of in, in the round. But I'd say that's the bit I find the hardest. OK, thank you. Um, I'm just going to finish off with one question that actually comes from our New York campus. You may be aware we've, we've got a campus in, in New York um, and Sharon, um, one of our master's ca uh, candidates in New York, is working on her dissertation in fines, financing and profit profitability of her subject, um, building a textile re, uh, recycling and innovation industry in New York, one of the hardest aspects. Can you share your thoughts on how we address our global need for financial sustainability? It's, it's such an important topic and I can see in the chat there's also, um, somebody else has also talked a little bit about um, what, oh, hi Sharon, thank you for the wave. But someone else has also mentioned around the impact of um, of climate as well. That this whole sustainability agenda is one that I think we're all delighted is really kind of capturing um, ca capturing a real kind of momentum. And in fact, Sharon, um, I'm sure they have these conversations in New York. But I had a great day in Glasgow earlier this year where I went to to spend time with. Uh, a, Glas a Glasgow body and I can't remember the name of it it will hopefully come to me talking about how do you deal with the whole circle of, of financing so that actually it's zero impact of what you're doing in the in the different economies and I do think I, I met when I was up in Glasgow I met a fantastic uh, local Glasgow firm who is a leather-based firm and they're almost completely carbon neutral in all that they do but, but they are also highly profitable um, in terms of, of what they do and I think they that piece is such an important and evolving area in terms of how do we um, get real profitability from from that kind of sector where it's recycling it's using the right innovation to actually really drive the financial piece you know we've done in in that west we're the largest lender to renewable energy you know i think um, which is is something that we're we're very proud of we've reduced our exposure to coal that's great in today's narrative. We actually did it because it was it was really risky and we were it wasn't something we could get the right margin on. You know, when I was talking um, a couple of weeks ago with some somebody from the EBA in Europe, I really believe that in a, a, a very short period of time, the amount of capital that we allocate to our lending, it will be cheaper if you are um, lower carbon, a lower carbon economy to make us encouraged to lend much more into that market. And that's something that is definitely coming. So there'll be add-ons if you're lending to things that are too capital and carbon intensive, 
and there'll be credits uh, for the banks to take if we're um, if we're much more in your space of kind of textile recycling, which will make it easier for you to then fund, which then will help the kind of profitability of that. Sharon, I'm conscious you've also come off off mute. If there's any any way you can help guide my answer, if I'm not giving you what you would like. Oh, it's it, you're completely on on track, and I really appreciate. Uh, you saying that there are there will be incentives in the banking sector for this, um, and I would love to ask if I can connect with you personally. Yeah, no, please, please, please do so. I'm I'm easy Great. I'm easy enough to find um, in terms of on the web. So if you if you Google me, you'll be able to find my my email email address. But look, it definitely is coming. I had the pleasure of meeting um, the chap from the EBA who wrote the BAL guidance. And he said it took him five years to negotiate BAL. Now, BAL hasn't even come in yet, and I've spent five years doing it. And he then said, I've then gone on to write the guidance from the, the Banking Association on the impact of climate. And he said that has gone through the European Union in one year in terms of where they've got to today. So the will behind it is enormous. You know, and he was talking to us and he said, you know, there's three different legs that you do and um, that you make change. First of all, you make people do better disclosure. You know, and then ultimately you give them carb you give them credits on their capital. And he said, you know, if I was talking to a class like this, he would be saying, why are you just making the banks do decent disclosure? You should be giving them penalties on their capital because they're not actually changing their lending. And um, because of that's how you actually will make change. And what was really interesting, we started having those conversations conversations as a European CFO group about 18 months ago. And we're already at the point about talking what it does to capital, and we haven't even got our first disclosures out. So things are moving very quickly in that space. And Europe is so much better than we are here in the US. But you <laughs> will learn from us in time as well. <laughs> and hopefully our election will change some things. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Um, thank you uh, for that um, Q&A session, Katie. I hope we energy energized no, you no, slightly. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I will hand over to the, the principal to, to bring the, today's event to a close. Julie, thank you very much. Well, Katie, thank you so much for sharing your personal story with us today. It was so engaging and frankly interesting because you allowed us uh, to hear about the context in which you developed your leaders, leadership skills, a wee bit about your own life, and you allowed your personality to shine through. But some of the lessons I took away uh, from your talk are actually leadership skills that you need in any part of, uh, of either the economy or the public services. I think the thing that struck me that you emphasised, it kept you kept repeating it throughout your, your story was the need to be authentic and empathetic um, and to be honest in difficult situations. And it's absolutely critical. We've seen that in, in political life, haven't we, recently. Jacinda Ardern, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, has, has demonstrated the strength that comes from being authentic, true to yourself and being empathetic. It's not a weakness to show empathy. And I think that's, that's a really strong lesson we can take away. I loved when you told us about the need to, whatever our age, take opportunities, be a wee bit brave, you know, have a go. I love I loved that. Um, but you emphasized to, to get on, you have to work hard, you've got to focus on delivery, um, you've got to do a wee bit of your homework, you know, find out, find out uh, what people want from you. And you've got to be willing to be collaborative. And that means uh, supporting others, not just leading from the front, allowing others to come forward into leadership roles. So I love that. I also um, uh, thought it was really important that you mentioned it helps to learn a language. We live in a connected global world um, and it's, it really opens doors of opportunities. If you have the opportunity to learn another language, you learned Spanish, it could be French or German or uh, Hindi, whatever it is, it will transform your, your life. And last but no means least, well, you come across as somebody you'd want to go out for a wee drink and have dinner with. You know, that's so important in life. You're holding one of, one of the most important, you know, leadership roles that you can hold in the banking sector. But we all want to go out for a wee drink with you, Katie. And so having fun, in life is tremendously important. It's shone through your talk and we deeply appreciate you sharing the time with us. Thank you so much.
be my absolute pleasure, Pamela. And may, may we all be allowed to go out for a wee drink and a dinner before too long. But um, <laughs> thank you very much. Enjoy your evenings. Lovely to see you, Anne. Lovely to see you, Helen. Ian, thanks very much. See you later. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thanks, Katie. Bye-bye.